stormtropper og grenaderer går til motangrep etter at artillerieilden har banet vei. Yeah, I like that. That's great footage. But what makes stock film footage great? The quality of the image is important. Also, if the footage is rare or can be seen in all the World War II History Channel productions matters, obviously how interesting the content is is also a determined factor. For example, this excellent material shows the German tank destroyer Elephant in action. And to be honest, among amateur historians, that's about as good as it gets. This footage comes from the newsreel series Ausland Tonwoche, and this particular reel is in its original Norwegian language. Like the Deutsche Wochenschau, which was shown to the German public in cinemas before feature films, this was shown to Norwegian moviegoers. It's a the war this week kind of thing. The ATW reels were produced by the German Uefer Production Company and was made up of a combination of Wolkenschau material and footage that was shot in the host country. One of the advantages of these ATW reels now is that the occupied countries did not suffer the extended bombing campaigns that Germany did, and so much of the material survived the war intact. Of course, those who collaborated with the Germans had reason for the material to disappear. When the footage can be found, it is often in great condition. Today, we'll look at parts of this Norwegian Ausland Tonvoha, reel number one from 1944. About three minutes into it, you'll see the elephant footage. There's more than you just saw. And then we'll stop and take a look at an original blueprint of the tank destroyer talk about its characteristics, strengths and weaknesses, and its development. After looking at the blueprint, I'll show one more choice clip of the elephant, so stick around. And we'll see some footage that was taken in Norway. Remember, if you're interested in seeing more original material, subscribe to this channel and hit the like button. In Aust, the Tyske soldaten fortsatt i voldsomme forsvarskamper. Et tysk tilførselsfly i sikte. Flyskule viser besetningen hvor tilførselene skal kastes ut. Dette U-52 kaster ut på pleining, ammunisjon og post. Feltkjøkkenet har atter forsyning nok. Tyske reserver på frammarsj i det midtre frontavsnittet. Slammen har kommet senere i år enn ellers. Fjelltropper rykker inn i ny stilling. Bolsjevikene angriper. Fjellskytse viser seg å være yppelig også på flatlandet. Tåkekastere tar del i kanten. Stormtropper og grenaderer går til motangrep etter at artillerieilden har banet vei. Det 
Philippine, the Angrepe Brüter Summon. Öde nackte Sowjet Panzerwagner decker Slagmarken. So here's the blueprint of an elephant tank destroyer. A tank destroyer is an armored vehicle that has a fixed and usually high caliber cannon. Its main role is to destroy tanks. The elephant was originally called the Ferdinand after its designer, Ferdinand Porsche. It had a powerful and accurate 88 millimeter cannon, which had been developed to be used as a long range anti-tank gun capable of taking out tanks at ranges of about 7,500 feet. Because of its heavy frontal armor, enemy tanks would usually need to be within 1,600 feet to destroy a Ferdinand. It had 3.93 inches of thick frontal armor with an additional 3.93 inches plate that was bolted on, giving it a massive 7.87 inches of frontal protection. The hull and superstructure armor had a thickness of 3.15 inches and the top armor was 1.18 inches. The bottom of the tank destroyer only had armor of 0.79 inches thick. It was 26 feet 8 inches long, 11 feet wide, and 9 feet 9 inches tall. The massive vehicle had a combat ready weight of 69 tons which made it the largest tank at the time it was introduced. It could travel at 19 miles per hour for a maximum of about 55 miles. The vehicle had a crew of six with the driver and radio operator situated up front. The commander, gunner, and two loaders were behind them in the combat compartment of the tank destroyer. The Ferdinand had some significant weaknesses that the Russians would take advantage of. It was so loud that it could be heard for miles, which meant that spotting for the Soviet artillery was relatively easy. Under a constant hail of artillery, the infantry avoided accompanying it. Its large footprint and lightly armored underbelly meant that it was easily knocked out of action by mines. And an immobilized, unaccompanied Ferdinand without MGs or even a turret was basically a sitting duck. Here's some Russian footage from Kursk that shows how the Russian infantry dealt with the Ferdinand. Яростные атаки врага на земле и с воздуха разбили со беспримерной стойкости мужества советских воинов. Там, где вражеским танкам удавалось прорваться сквозь заградительный огонь артиллерии, их встречали губительными выстрелами бойцы, бронебойщики. Их выводили из строя советские пехотинцы. I love the Russian footage. As you might expect, the camera crews were a little crazy and really got into the thick of the fighting. The Soviet propagandists also tended to combine their own combat footage with captured German films, creating a kind of battlefield collage. It gives you a good feel for the intensity of the combat. I like it. In the footage, we see a Russian machine gun crew pinning down the crew trapped inside a disabled Ferdinand. At the same time, infantry could advance and destroy it using relatively primitive anti-tank weapons. Finally, in January of 1944, based mostly on the experience gained at Kursk, Upgrades were made to the Ferdinand, including adding a ball-mounted MG to its front hull, adding additional protection to the engine plates, which had proven to be vulnerable to shrapnel, and adding a coat of anti-magnetic mine paste to its underbelly. In May of 1944, the name was officially changed to the Elephant, and the use of non-modified Ferdinands was strictly forbidden.